Foul Life Podcast, what's up? Chad Belling back at you, another episode straight out of the great state of Wisconsin. Cheeseheads, breweries, I think fish fries, walleye, hunting, fishing, the outdoor lifestyle. It's beautiful here. I know there's some big cities. You got Milwaukee, Green Bay's pretty big, Madison's pretty big, but man, there's such big country here. We got to witness the opening day of gun season for deer, 600,000 deer hunters in the state of Wisconsin. Crazy to think about all that blaze orange and all that venison backstrap tenderloin roasts and ribs hitting the dirt. Today's episode of the Fat Life Podcast is brought to you by the one and only Rigid Industries. Own the night. You have to see when it's dark. I want to be able to see whether I'm in my trailer grabbing gear, whether I'm in setting up decoys in a field, whether I'm in my boat going down a pathway in Arkansas trying not to hit some stumps or some flooded timber trees. Thank you, Rigid Industries, for producing the best top quality, hands down, lights, LED lights and packages, light bars, fog lights, anything that you need for your UTV, ATV, boat, truck, bumpers, rear bumpers, look no further than Rigid Industries. And today, the second partner, we're going to start off this podcast, my guest, Joel Clayfish, you've heard him here before, resident native of wisconsin his wife rebecca is running for the 2022 governor governor of wisconsin is that governorial <laughs> gubernatorial Gu- gubernatorial gubernatorial not gubernatorial what is it governorial it's gubernatorial is it really for real gubernatorial we also have <laughs> color commentary by the one and only chase is that with rice. a b or a v with a b goober with a b gubernatorial that's is chase important? rice on the color commentary <laughs> He will come in with a song here in a little bit. I just don't know which one yet. And the next partner that this episode is brought to you by is one that we use tonight. Joel, and I want Chase to pitch in on this too, but how unbelievable was that meat grinder made by meat? Made by, made by meat. Meet your maker. M-E-A-T. Grinders. Mixers. Tumblers. Vacuum sealers. Saws. You name it. This is an unbelievable product. Was that cool? We took Canada Goose Breast, mixed it with some pork loin or some pork butt with high fat content, took it straight out of the grinder, straight to the olive oil, and had street tacos within a matter of minutes. Pretty cool. That was amazing. I, you know, I thought we're going to be grinding meat. It's going to be an all night affair. We're not going to eat till ten o'clock at night. <laughs> that thing made such quick work out of it. That goose was in in the air a couple hours ago in the grinder, making Mitchell Con style street tacos with the flavors from the provider rubs. It was unbelievable. Yeah, we used a little bit of swine, a little bit of fowl, yep. and then we ended it. We topped it off right before it went on the grease with Sonora. Sonora is bomb. Now. Chase did say at one point after he took his first or second bite that they were legit tacos. This is a man that's eaten some taco. What did you think, Chase? Were they totally legit? Best taco I've ever had. Are you being for real? I'm being dead serious. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Canada Goose Meat. Incredible. They were good, huh? I, I honestly, Joel, I didn't know if Chad was more of a hunter or a chef. I'm leaning towards chef. <laughs> yeah, for real. If somebody can kill it, I'll cook it. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> At least in the last it, couple days, he's yeah. been more of a chef. No, he's definitely not a hunter. He's a chef, though. He's a great chef. <laughs> well, that was a team effort all week, but we're coming to the end. You were getting kind of sentimental tonight, kind of like, uh, I don't know, like you go on vacation, you're all excited. You get fired up. The resort's there. The bars are there. The ocean's there. The beach is there. The sun's there. The vibes are there. The pool's there. The meals are there. A lot of times on vacation, you're like, man, I can't wait to get back home. It happens a lot. Some people are more like, man, I wish I had another week here, but I'm kind of itching to get back to the routine, right? This was a kind of a different trip to where you're like, damn it, man. It feels like it was just getting started. It was kind of a it was kind of a neat experience, obviously, the entire 10 days. But as it comes to an end, what's going through your mind? I'm really melancholy. I got the Sunday blues over it. You know, when you're young and you're going to going to school and it's kind of Sunday night and you start getting disappointed because the weekend's coming to an end. I had I'll be honest, I had no idea what 
uh, we could expect when you guys were coming into town. And I have to say, I mean, you hear the word fast friendship and we met and we're exchanging barbs and ribs and one up in each other right off the bat. And that just got deeper, uh, the entire trip. And all of a sudden then you mix food with it. And, you know, part of the culture of Wisconsin is not only how much people care about their lifestyle here, but when you have a provider lifestyle and it was absolutely coincidental that you ended up here on the opening of the gun deer season, you got the orange army heading into the woods here. And that is more than a tradition here in Wisconsin. That that's a religion. And you guys are here while that religion's taking place, and you can see the people of Wisconsin who are some of the kindest you'll ever meet, uh, the most giving, generous folks you'll ever meet, and you mix that with the laughing in the field and the storytelling and the camaraderie and the guys from Traeger coming in and Vortex and, and Chase and Walker Bueller, just fantastic people, and you start to think to yourself, these are people who, if they were here on a regular basis, would be hanging out all the time and we'd be good friends. And when you share a field with somebody, you're sharing more than just a hunt. You're sharing an experience and a lifestyle that's going to start in a field and end up where people become the closest. And that's over good food cooked together from the field to the table with fantastic fresh ingredients and the most organic meat you can ever have. And so now today it, it really hit me uh, on the shoulders. I thought, oh my gosh, these guys are leaving tomorrow. And I'm really I'm really sad about it. I'm really melancholy about it. It's been just a phenomenal uh, life experience for me. So fun. I agree. Do you ever get sad, Chase, when you have to leave somewhere? Like, you travel a lot. So I know Brent Cobb, a buddy of mine from Georgia, just south of where you're from, told me one time his favorite part of touring is going home. So are you, do you like being on the road with your lifestyle, or do you have you gotten to the point now in your mid-30s to where you're like, man, I just want to be on my farm with my buffalo and chilling? Uh, to be honest, it depends on the run that we're doing. It's like, man, if if we're hitting sick towns or we're we're talking about Wisconsin Summerfest, if Summer Summerfest is happening on a Saturday, on a Friday night, I'm not ready to go home. I want to go to Summerfest. Um, so it depends on the shows, to be honest, because and usually even if you have three awesome shows in a row, it's uh. You're by Saturday night. You're ready to go home. You're ready to be yeah. done. You had a saying this week though, and I can't remember verbatim how it goes, but it's you said, Chad, you're the person I would want to be if I didn't have to care. <laughs> what, how does the saying go? <laughs> well, you're kind of like my alter ego. I said, uh, Chad, you're the person you are. If, uh, you're the person I'd like to be if I didn't have to worry about who I was. That seems. <laughs> that sounds kind of mean. <laughs> It sounds <laughs> you got no sleeves on, Chad. Yeah. Every, everybody wants to live with no sleeves. <laughs> but doesn't that that sound, sounds kind of mean? Is this meant to be mean? Absolutely not. You know, we, we talked about it, and, and my wife and I live in the political arena, and and I did leave the political political arena, but she's really heavily steeped in it. And you got to kind of you got to watch what you say and watch how you act, and, and every once in a while you've got this veil in front of you to make sure there could be somebody recording you at any given time or listening to you ready to screw up what you said or uh, accuse you of something. So you, you've got to always kind of be careful of your complete person coming out at all times. And, uh, you know, around you, you are an absolutely real person, 100% top to bottom, left to right, real all the time. And it's enjoyable to be around you because I, one of the things I think that we developed as friends was that I'm not worried about what I say or how I act around you because that's really me. And one of the freest places to be is in a blind with your friends when you are expressing and being who you truly are. And so that was a gift to me this week and something that I, I will cherish because, man, we were ourselves and my stomach muscles I haven't had this kind of workout in a long time from laughing. Yeah, it was a lot of, lot of high intensity, laughing and ribbing for sure. But there was there was a lot of work that got done. That's one thing that a lot of people get surprised by when we come into town of like how much work there is to be done. And just when you think that we're done, then we's like, well, let's do that. Like we have an extra fifteen minutes, let's do that. And you almost 
have a hard time turning it off. And that's where people get stuck. So when you're saying that about like, you're the person that I would want to be if I didn't have to worry about who I was, I would think that it had something to do along the lines of most people tell me, you just, you're always on, you never turn it off. And is a simple act of cooking. I'm trying to sell something through that cooking experience, right? Which I give people shit a lot. You go to a Chase Rice concert and you watch it through a four inch screen. What are you really accomplishing? You're going to have a video on your phone to put on YouTube where people are going to say, you should put that on who gives a shit.com. You can go get hours of Chase Rice footage if you want to, the way the world is. So you're, the, the experience and the authenticity of, of, of living life in my opinion, is being lost through our our uh, our mindsets and our ideologies and our thinking process that we have to have proof. We have to capture it. It's almost like, who's going to believe that we grinded goose meat and cooked it that fast if we don't film it and put it on our Instagram? Well, really, who gives a shit? Who cares if people know about it or not? Because the authenticity, now you can look at that and go, well, you're building a brand. You work with me. You have the provider. You got to get that content. But man... It's nonstop because where does it stop? What meal can I cook where I don't go, oh, I don't need to film this one. I, I film every one of them. Yeah, I, I think you just hit on one of the quintessential, most important and sad parts of society right now is that people are trying to experience everything on their three inch by seven inch screen in two dimensions and life happens in three dimensions. And that is what getting into the outdoors is actually about experiencing three dimensional life, taking that and putting it on the dinner table. The dinner table, the three by seven, I had to bring my daughter in. She's calling me on FaceTime. That's Chase Rice. This is my daughter, Alyssa. You listen to his music, Lissy. Hey, Lissy. Hello. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> and that's Joel. That is cool. Hi, Liz. I wanted to say hi. I didn't want to put you into voicemail. I love you. I miss you. I'm in a podcast talking about hunting and cooking wild game. How's the puppy? He's also kind of talking about what you were just talking about. Yeah. 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 It's not the same. You're kind of the same, huh? <laughs> what? Oh, nice. I'll call you when I'm out of here, okay? Okay, bye bye. You're cutting out really bad. Okay, I'll get upstairs. <laughs> so Chase says I'm kind of doing, you know, by that. You don't want to miss a call from your daughter. And a lot of times you're like, thank God, when you travel like this, that we do have FaceTime and Zoom or Skype because you get to see them. Before, when I first started trying to travel like this, talking on the phone's not the same. You hear their voice, but now you can see them. But I don't know. It's like I'm always saying, like, when do you turn it off? Well, and technology. Look, technology is fantastic, and without technology, uh, you wouldn't. You, you and I and Chase wouldn't be able to share the joy we have in the field, which actually gets people interested and pulls them out to the field and gets new people involved. <laughs> right. But so there's the conundrum right there. When do you put the phone down or the cameras down and and enjoy the hunt? And there's time for both. And this life has got so much to offer, especially if you're spending time in the outdoors and enjoying what God has given you. And you can get caught in both sides of it too much. And that's why, you know, life is about a balance. But in all reality, if you spend too much time on the phone or watching, you know, the, the Snapchat or the, the TikTok or all that stuff, you're not experiencing life in 3D. Go get your organic meat and put it on the table. Use some spices. Try a recipe you've never tried. You know, you scared the crap out of me when you came here and we're talking about some of the recipes right off the bat. And a lot of times we did use the provider cookbook as a base, but some Sometimes we were completely winging it, switching things up as we went along. And all I can say is everything we made far exceeded my expectations. Every it was delicious. Them. Every one of them did. And I think that, I think that before we get off this subject, I want to ask Chase something. Chase, do you ever, like, you, I could go on and you watch, like, Guns N' Roses or some band's fan, you know, Instagram and their, their stories. It's almost like... Why would I even go to a concert anymore? Do you ever think like you can literally like go on the night before you play Milwaukee, let's say that you're in Minneapolis and there's so much content from that show that's readily available that you're like, is the experience really back in the day when these rock bands or country singers were playing, it was a total surprise of what they were going to do because nobody knew from city to city unless they traveled and were, 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 were stopping with the band at every stop. Does that make sense to you? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I don't want people, eh, I don't want people at my shows to just want to experience it through the phone. Like, it, it, it's a tough deal because people are going to do that no matter what. I've done that. I saw the Stones in Austin on uh, Saturday. Yeah, three days ago. And I took one video. I took No, I took one picture. That was it. But I did that on purpose. It was intentional because I know what it's like to be on the stage looking out and you see a bunch of phones. And I genuinely had to wonder if I could get my lighter into the show because that was I, want, the old days. I wanted to smoke a little during the show and you decide whatever you want that to be. I just want to smoke a cigarette during the show. And I didn't know if I could get my lighter into the show. And I was like, man, that's what you used to hold up during the slow songs. And now it's the, fl- the flashlight. Now it's a fl- now it's your phone. So you don't know if that's a video or what. But I just I want people to come and me personally, I want people to come and enjoy the show as it is. I think those days are done. But you know, I I can't stop that. All I can do is show up and do do the show. The, I, I like artist. I like to have talks with my partners. You know the the sponsors that we work with is. I like to talk to them about, do you want all of this, every single thing that we experience? Like, do you want me filming the blind and the ducks hanging on my strap and my gun and my ammo and this and that? And I'm, I'm, I used to constantly do that. And I was good this trip. I very rarely filmed because my partners are getting the mindset of like, hey, you enjoy the hunt and showcase it your way through blogging or writing or the TV. You don't always have to be on and I think that that is what is going to wear people out faster than anything. Even though I enjoy what I do and I'm honored and humbled, and I'm not humbled, Billy. I want to be humbled anyway. But <clears throat> I think that if I knew that I had to have my phone out all the time and filming every little step of every process that we do and that the partners were going to be, if you don't, you're fired. I just have this mindset that I want to under promise and over deliver. And that's why when your wife says, Are you always on? Do you ever sleep? I don't know. I don't know how. I don't really know. Like, what is on? What is my on and what is my off? This is just what I do, right? But it would be nice just to go out with no cameras once in a while, no phones, and just be yourself. Because, like... You when you're in when you're on TV or you're doing social media, you you have to be different than who you really are. I want to be real, but I, I cuss once in a while. I drink a Jack Daniels once in a while. I take a maybe a chew here, you know, every couple months. You just can't do that when you're doing that this part of the gig. And so, I, I just think that that whole I, that whole aura that we're stuck in of we have to prove it. We have to get likes. I don't care about a like. I know he doesn't. I know Chase doesn't. I know that you're going to build. His, he's going to build his career on authenticity and country music and what he's doing. You, you're kind of you're all, you're a little bit older than me by eight, like almost nine and a half years. But <laughs> three, you went there three years. I'm you three years there. older than him. Unbelievable. And Chad. I think we look the same age. Actually, I think you look better than Chad. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but you don't really have to get your wife has to a little bit running a campaign, but really. Her politics should be judged on her policies and her character than how many likes she gets, even if it I'm I'm sure it's creating some kind of awareness. Yeah, look, life's about experiences, not things, right? Sure. I mean, at the end at the end of the day, when you're looking back on the best things in life, nobody names something that they own. They Talk about experiences. And I think that even crosses over into marketing, into your show, into what you're what you're trying to sell. And when you're showing people the experience you're having and the joy you're having in that experience, I mean that's marketing 101 right there. People are gonna buy a product because they're seeing you enjoy what you're doing while you're using that product much more than if they're looking at the product. They're gonna say that guy is having an experience that 10 years from now he's gonna look back and say that was one of the best duck hunts I ever had. I laughed my butt off. We we're joking around. My hands were freezing. And oh yeah, he was using a Benelli when he had that experience. That's the, the likability. And that is, that's marketing anyway. So I think you hit it on the head. Showing people the experience is great salesmanship without the work of selling. And you don't have to Ricky Bobby and be like, if you don't chew big red, <laughs> I've always said that I want to create. Well, I was going to say for me, like, 
I wouldn't think about that. I, I, I would think about how awesome the experience was. And then later I would hit up Chad and be like, hey, man, by the way, what, what guns were you using? Those things yeah. were awesome. You wouldn't even know. Yeah. And then he would hit you up and be like, yeah, these are Benelli SB3s. Yeah. Um, whatever they're shooting. Yeah. I don't know. But does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. They, they, they live through you vicariously and they get in your truck, your seat of your, the front cab of your truck to ride along with you. That's what my vision and my goal with the foul life always was. We were never the best. I mean, I'm from freaking Nevada. How good of a duck hunter can I be? <laughs> I live in the desert. Nobody knows how to blow a duck call out there. So how good, I took so much shit the first five years of this company. Like, Nevada, you don't know what you're doing. Maybe I don't. But I wanted to build a brand of like, this is who we are and this is what we're doing. And I want people to say, I want to be in that blind with them. Yep. Nobody's better than anybody else. It's therapeutic. And I didn't want to be that person that's like, man, you better shoot a Benelli or you will never, ever experience waterfowl hunting like God intended it to be. You could have a Browning or a Winchester or a, any of the guns out there, a Remington, and experience a fine duck hunt. We are humbled and are not are not humble, but honored to be part of the Benelli family and legacy. And they are the best shotgun of all time. But that doesn't mean that you have to shoot a Benelli to ha- be a good or consistently f- successful or a happy duck and goose hunter. You just it's that would be asinine to say that. So I always wanted to sell the product through experience of yep. somebody being like, I want to live that lifestyle. And for me to do that, I want to do what they're doing. So I'm going to wear a real tree. I'm going to wear a bandit. I'm going to shoot a Benelli. It wasn't always about like, Here's why you should shoot a Benelli, a three and a half inch chamber, and it's got the inertia driven right. system. You don't have to worry about gas, and it's easy to clean, it's easy to take apart. Blah, 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 blah. I never really had to do that. Even though I do understand the ins and outs of a Benelli, I never had to really get on and sell it that way. So, that, that, my question to you, Chase, is if Subaru came to you tomorrow, would you take no. it? To, see, that's, that's authenticity in marketing, right? So, like, I, I'm a Ford truck guy. And I mean this from everything. I've had dealerships in, it, that that deal with the other major manufacturers of automobiles come to me and say, would you consider talking about a deal? And my answer was just like that. No. Not, hey, show me what you're thinking. How much are you thinking? It was no from the beginning. I'm driving a Ford truck. That's what I want. And that's what I'm going to do. Benelli doesn't know this, but if they came to me tomorrow and said, we're cutting your money, I'd say, I'll just shoot them for free. I'm not going to have a revolving door. I know that's what pays the bills. And Benelli knows that too. But I am not going to spend 12 years of my life telling the world that Benelli helps me live these experiences and then jump into another one just because the money's better. That would be asinine on my part. A lot of people base their decisions on the bottom line. I don't want to do that. I think that the money could come elsewhere if you're authentic authentic from the beginning. But let's get into the, the idea of waterfowl hunting. Waterfowl hunting is a very, I want to say this again, I'm talking aggravating and difficult form of hunting. It is so hard that even the most seasoned people that think that they have it figured out will get your ass kicked a lot. You might have a run of four or five days where you get them every day. But I'm talking, we had a run this time a few days of, the geese got stale. The geese got tough. Yeah. The weather up north got warm. The new birds weren't moving into the air. All the factors that go into it, you have to stay optimistic. I'm the first one to say, that hunt's not for me. It's not where I want to be. I don't really want to go. I don't want to try what we're thinking about doing. Not that I don't appreciate new experiences, but I also understand that it's not going to work for how we're filming a hunt or how we're trying to document a hunt. You know what I mean? So this week really showed me of like, even when you think you're in the right spot at the right time, all of the time, one little thing can go wrong. One little thing, whether it was the full moon that came in, whether it was the change in the temperature where it went from real hot to real, real cold. And then it warmed up again. I don't know if I've ever had a more difficult time in my hunting career, patterning birds than this trip to Wisconsin. You hunt here a lot. Mm-hmm. You're a native here. Yep. You kill, you've killed a lot of geese. This was a difficult stretch for you as well, right? Yeah. It's tough. You know, there's so many factors that come into play when you're out waterfall hunting, goose hunting, or duck hunting. Let's take goose hunting, though. You know, you got wind, hide. Hide and wind are probably the two biggest things you got to worry about. You got to have a a real dynamite hide with geese because they're looking at you the whole time. 
And then we had stale birds. Now, we, we've had hunts where we sat there and watched, no joke, 2,000 geese within 1,000 yards of us. And they'd get to that 500, 300-yard line and flip us the bird, no pun intended, and they were gone. And I'm going to tell you, man, when that happens, that is so frustrating. That's what happened tonight. You're trying to make, you are trying so hard. Uh, you've got your spread right. You know, you've you, you got fantastic callers. We had a state duck, uh, goose calling champion in the blind. And those geese are saying, nope, not today, fellas. We know you're there. That doesn't look right. But I'm going to tell you why waterfowl hunting is the best hunting you will do. Because as hard as you work at it, as physically demanding as it is carrying bags of decoys to the middle of a field through chisel plow up to your ankles, you know, walking treading carefully so you don't twist an ankle and sweating when you're setting up and sometimes getting cold when you're sitting in the blind and every once in a while mother nature wins mother nature gets to win and that is the very quintessential thing that makes it so fantastic when you beat mother nature and you got a pile at the end of the day those wins those that when when everything works perfectly those would not be as good if you did not remember the times that the geese got to win so you're saying it's more based on tricking and beating mother nature than opposed to deer hunting and other forms of hunting oh man are you sitting here trying to tell the podcast audience of the foul life that waterfowl hunters are the smartest hunters in the world i kind of feel like that's what you just said <laughs> i'm gonna go to i'm gonna tell you what uh waterfowl hunters are the hardest working hunters that are out i there. feel like that one i will give you i hunt elk in montana and that's you're hiking you're you're busting it but you're not setting anything up. You're just getting up there, going. Waterfowl is like it's it's labor. You yeah, gotta, you got to labor it out. And then when you're done, and everything's like, oh, that was fun, and we got them, or we didn't. And then you're like, oh shit, we can't just leave all this out here and get new stuff <laughs> right. for tomorrow. That, that's the thing is, like, waterfowl is setting up, tearing down. What happens in between is up to the ducks, up to the geese, up to God, and up to the. Yeah. You know the wind. But here's all the, of it. that that thing, like what Chase is talking about, is like what happens in between. I don't know if this is going to sound arrogant, and I hope it doesn't come off that way. I can tell when geese are within 500 yards of me if we're going to get them. And today, 100%. People would look at me and be like, "Why are you like not even care? Like, why are you not like fired up that we're seeing all these birds?" And I'll be like, "Because none of them are interested in anything we have to look." say look like anything i can tell from as soon as birds start coming at us from across those lines whether or not we're going to have a chance at those birds i can just tell absolutely and, and that comes with experience your instincts and reading body language and 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 how they you know their flight feathers and their wings and their feet and all that and their heads and their necks now i don't want it to sound like i'm trying to sound like oh you think you're a know-it-all about Arma. as you go you can be like we have a shot at these flocks not one flock of geese tonight flared off of us not one flock of geese tonight checked up one of them kind of did those two that pair that come in and they were like eh, i kind of like it but there were shadows and stuff but most of the geese that we saw tonight 99 percent of them out of the 2000 we saw or however many we did not have a shot to kill them and it wasn't because we weren't hidden it wasn't because we didn't sound like geese it wasn't because our decoy spread was too small maybe if we would have had 15 more dozen birds in there that we took three more hours to put out and we had to take two more hours to pick up i don't even think it would have helped and here's why they're weary geese. They're 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 tired. They're they've seen it. They're coming off a roost in fifth in twenty five mile an hour winds, at a half a mile high. They've been there, seen it. Geese that are comfortable and new to the area, they just kind of go like this. They're looking and they're right. cupped up. And you, right. I hope that you're not agreeing with me just because you think you need to. But I'm telling yeah. you, when geese come off a roost when they're new to an area, they don't shoot straight up in the sky and get way up there and get that nervous to really settle in and look for the big activity of the funnel of live birds going down like they did tonight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Have you ever been out, have you ever been out in the field and you'll see a flock of local geese below them? I mean, it, it, it's not their first rodeo, right? They've seen it. 
and you'll see the flock of lower geese and their necks are craning back and forth. And then you've got a flock of migrators up and behind them. And that those lower geese, you'll see them kind of cupping to come in and look. And as soon as they realize they get it, they've seen it before, they're not going to have any part of it. You'll actually see them swing off and you'll see the migrators behind them cup up and finish in the decoys. Yeah, I've, I've seen, seen it, it. it lots of times, lots of times. And that goes to exactly what you're saying. I bet dimes to donuts. All those 2000 geese we saw today were local geese. There was not one from Canada among them. Because they all knew, they got to the field, they said, this isn't exactly right. None of the decoys are moving. Something's up. Because they were turning. They didn't flare. They just avoided us. They've seen it. They've seen it. There's They've a seen lot, it There's a lot of spreads around. I don't know. There's a lot of goose hunters around I, this yeah, area. Yeah, I didn't know if there, was migra- if, they, if, if there was no migrators in there. But I have never, ever seen that many days in a row of uncooperative geese and not just it's not like we were hunting within five miles every day we were hunting with we would go 40 miles to the west 40 miles to the northeast 50 miles this way this today we were we were 60 miles from where we were staying so it wasn't like we were hunting the same birds every day and you can't every goose was smart every goose was smart so either that means that there's a lot of hunters that are pressuring them up north of here or they're local birds and that the warm weather in Canada has not pushed enough birds down to give you a fair shot. Now, I don't know if this has been a tough season for you guys as a whole, because I heard you mopped them up in October, yeah. but this was a tough 10 day run. I'm not saying it in a negative way. I'm simply saying that the, even the, the most seasoned of waterfowl hunters get their ass kicked a lot. And, yeah, no and I'm not saying it's me. No you, guys, doubt. you guys are just as seasoned as I am. You've been hunting geese since you were 29, and now you're almost 65. So that's quite a few years. And, and Damn, he went, he went after you. He went after you. Come on. I'm, I must be cradle robin with my wife then. God, she looked good tonight. I don't know who's going to have the hotter governor, South Dakota or Wisconsin after this race. Both the best. Well, the, best. the only thing I can say is that Wisconsin's going to have the, the hotter first spouse. Oh. <laughs> well, they're gonna be like they're gonna be like i've met both families i've met both families now south dakota and now wisconsin and they're both top notch i'll say that in wisconsin <laughs> yes gonna, they are in wisconsin they're gonna be like hey governor why is your dad here at this black town event with you <laughs> you know i get asked that from time to time do you really yes oh god that would wear me out oh man here's here's the thing though to keep in mind about this what else i'm always thinking about like why why didn't it go our way today I want to know what kind of decoys you're supposed to use on a Canada goose hunt now. I really, like, I feel like I know Canada geese and Canada goose hunting inside and out. I've been on the most unbelievable Canada goose hunts on water and dry fields that you could ever imagine. From northern Alberta and Saskatchewan all the way down to Texas. All the way down to, you know, California, New Mexico. All the way down to freaking Oklahoma and southeast Kansas. As far south as Canada geese go, really. They really don't get down into Louisiana or the Gulf of Mexico. What are you supposed to use now? I got, we got our ass kicked with top notch, carved, anatomically correct, textured, feathered detail, moving in the wind on the stake system that we designed at Greenhead Gear, postures that are so anatomically correct that you look at it like, holy shit, that looks like a bunch of geese out there. We mixed them in with cacklers. We mixed them in with lessers. We mixed them in with silhouettes once in a while. What in the are you supposed to hunt over? <laughs> That's why I asked myself driving home tonight, like, what are, what are we doing? What, why are we not decoying geese when I'm so used to decoying geese? And we didn't, I'm going to say this with, I hope you don't get mad at me saying this. We decoyed less than 15 geese this trip. Maybe 60, maybe 15 to 60, somewhere in that realm, including that first day, because we would have an argument of over what decoying means to you or what it means to me. But is it fair to say that we did not decoy that many geese? And we have very good decoy spreads. I think that's completely fair to say. So Wisconsin, you get your September season and you've got a ton of local birds and they're doing it stupid right in the decoys. Boots down in the decoys. Okay. Tostito feet in the decoys. Blue. Uh, blue corn tortilla chip feet in the decoys. <laughs> and you can run your silhouettes. You can run your full bodies right off the bat. In Wisconsin, now remember, we kill more 
Canada geese per capita than any other state in the country here. We've got a ton of hunters out. There's a ton of pressure. So those early geese start in September and they start out and they're, and they're dying over spreads. They're coming right into spreads. Then you start questioning, what's our hide? Should we be in layouts? Should we be in grass blinds? Uh, do we use uh, silhouettes anymore? For a while, for about three, four years in Wisconsin, everybody was using silhouettes, putting out 12 dozen silhouettes because it's real fast and easy. The geese here start getting used to it. So September geese start getting wary. That's when we get our first push from Canada. Then all of a sudden, everyone starts killing them again. You can go back to the silhouettes if you want, a little easier setup, a little less time, a little less work. And then the Canada geese push through and, and, and move forward. Then you get your November lull, which is where we are right now, obviously, by the fact that we've got 10 dozen full bodies out that look completely fantastic our hides are great and the geese are coming 500 yards away saying no thank you sir and they're on to the next field and and you know tonight they knew they knew they started dumping 700 yards away from us and then every other goose that came anywhere near us dumped right and we we, we got to sit and watch the show but at the end of the day, you're not out yeah, there we, bird watching. Yeah, we picked the wrong side of the barn tonight. <laughs> On the other side of that red barn, Dude. there was about 75,000 yeah. geese. That's a freaking song. That's a song right wrong side of the barn. Wrong side of the barn. I'm going to write that for the foul life. I went, <laughs> no, but it's about a, 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 the farmer's daughter. I went in there looking for Drew. We're going to have to get, uh, what's his name? Rodney Atkins. Rodney Atkins on that one. Farmer's daughter. Farmer's daughter. How did I know you were talking about him? But it is crazy. Anyway, it is crazy. To, oh, go ahead, Chase. I was just going to say, I'm intrigued to hear from the third person, you know, hanging out over here playing chess. It's cool to hear that because I'm a new, you know, duck hunter. Goose or geese. I don't know what the hell y'all even call them. But goose hunter. I'm a goose hunter. I'm a new goose hunter. Right. So it's cool to hear, like, your thought process that you've seen this for a month now so it, it, my, migratory animals for me it's elk and whitetail you know exactly what time of year they're going to be there you know exactly what time of year and in, it's give or take a week but they're going to be there and they're going to be screaming and they're going to be ready to go but yeah and they're running for or geese they're... this is pretty cool and and ducks it's, it's, and i love that you're I, lo I love how into it chase is because I, I wish that I could tell him how freaking miserable he's going to be in the next 60 months of his life. Like He's going to be like, I'm going to hang myself yes. on that tree right across the street. Because one of the hunts this week, I was looking for a branch that would hold me. I was like, I wonder if I have a rope in my trailer because it wouldn't take nothing. Is it strong me. enough? Is, it, is, is a tree holding off water to hold me? Yeah. Dude, I was like, what is going on here? Like, what is not? But here's the deal. Misery loves company. And this lifestyle of waterfowl hunting, I've always said this. Everything that we've done, I was talking about this in the blind tonight, everything that I've been lucky enough to have in life is because of a mallard duck. But they've literally driven me insane. Like, it's all I think about. Literally, like, when I'm, whatever I'm doing, I'm thinking about ducks. We merely exist in a duck's world. And I, I put that in, in, in a trademark because I really feel that they will drive you crazy they control your life i dream about it and they control your life yes. and people that don't do it look at people that do like us and they're like you are an absolute teetotaling ass clown like you are an idiot to to get that excited over something deer hunters are the same way but deer hunting is not as difficult as duck hunting or waterfowl hunting get, elk hunting is very difficult you know but you understand they're in this mountain range they're running this time of year. They're going to be right. with the cows this time of year. They're going to be with the, the, the batch of bulls this time of year. It's not the same as, as goose and duck hunting. If it was the same and you saw as many elk as we saw today, you'd have killed one of them. Right. One of them would have been like, I'm a cow and you're and I'm going to walk. These geese were literally like, you're an asshole for trying to kill us tonight. Yep. Every once in a while they get to win. I don't know about every once in a while. I'm talking like every freaking single day. <laughs> <laughs> but think of all think of all the different factors that we're talking about and any one day any one of those factors goes dramatically wrong and you're screwed and that is the pure joy that you hang on to because when the stars align you know we had vortex out for one of the hunts and we had seen a field that was just buzzing with tornadoes of ducks uh, two days before. Then the next day it was real cold and they weren't there. So we were taking a chance on this field. And you know, there were 40 minutes left of light and all of a sudden, the, just boom, the first pair drops in 
10 feet in front of us. And then the next pair and the next pair. And everything we did was perfect. Their, their, fe their feathers were so curled over when they were coming in, they were almost touching. And the hair on your arm stands up, the back of your neck stands up, and you say, this is the reason taking the losses makes the win so fantastic. And at the end of the day, we're sitting there taking our pictures with a seven man limit and a beautiful black duck. And we know we're gonna bring it home and, and, and filet them and, and eat duck for dinner. And you say to yourself, this is the reason. This is the thing that waterfowl hunters get to understand that the rest of hunting world who does not waterfowl hunt doesn't understand. And it's the reason you fall asleep and, and by the way, I'm a better duck and goose caller in my dreams than I am in real life. But this is the reason you dream about it. You wake up thinking about it. You wake up at 3 a.m. when you don't have to be up at 4 because you're that excited to get out of the to the field because life is not about accomplishment always it's about the possibilities and in waterfowl hunting life is about that possibility okay and let me tell you how i think about what you just said i'm not being uh -oh. negative but killing ducks in a dry field with mojos is the easiest thing in waterfowl hunting besides jump shooting with a hill in front of the i'm gonna pond. be honest i thought that waterfowl hunting would be a little more watery than what we <laughs> And it, and, and it should be. That's why it's called waterfowl hunting. But a lot of times up in this part of the country, there's what you call dry field feeds. And they don't hunt water up here very often. Just like in Canada, y'all don't hunt water very often. When I go to, when I leave here and I go to Missouri, we will not hunt in a dry field one time. It'll be water every day. As I get into Kansas, water. Oklahoma, both. Texas, all water. No dry field hunting huh. for ducks at all in Texas. You can if you're in a different county, like Haskell, and you're hunting in the peanut fields uh, down in Texas. You can get in, into it, but most of the hunting is water. But up here, a lot of it's dry field, but it's the easiest form of duck hunting there is. Now, I say that to say this. We kill that seven-man limit of mallards coming to that mojo. I could be freaking Butch Rickenbach or Jim Ronquist or Bernie Boyles are the best duck callers in the history of the world. Johnny Mafus, Trey Crawford, I'll keep going. I don't care what you sound like. You'll kill them over those mojos if you're in the field within the vicinity of where they're at. Now, I know that you're probably going to look at me and go, Chad, that's not fair to say. I'm not trying to take the power out of it. I'm not trying to take the fun out of it. I'm just simply saying there was a lot of geese that flew by our spread that night too. A lot. 500 lot, at least and not one of them decoyed that's a lie three of them decoyed on my right side way up on the hill what what gives we've got mojos out hit the button turn them off with your remote and those geese literally went you think we're as dumb as a duck <laughs> that duck just gave up his life because of a mojo that's what i'm trying to tell you is that i'm not i don't want anybody to take this out of this of me saying it's you know it's the easiest thing it truly is you have mojos in a dry field with ducks around your, your odds are pretty high of getting ducks to do. Now, you do have to be able to read them and, and, and call the shot at the right time and be patient and let them work and be hidden and all that. But don't get me wrong, Joel, but why can we kill a seven man limit of mallard ducks like it's our job and not get one goose to go, holy shit, I'm giving it up too. Yeah, and do you ever notice that a lot of times it depends whether you have the mojos on or off as to whether geese will commit to? I mean, they, they they very clearly think differently. And this goes to the, you know, people say, oh, you're a waterfall hunter. You're overanalyzing. That is your that that is our life, overanalyzing, overthinking, because it actually matters. The geese act differently than the ducks. And, and I've seen people out there going, man, alive, I can't stop killing geese if only I could kill a duck. But I think... That's true. I've seen that. I, I've seen it a million times. Oh, duck hunt. I love duck hunting. All, all I can ever kill is geese. This goes to what I think is the quintessential definition of hunting. Hunting is scouting. Hunting is driving. Hunting, hunting is windshield time. It's knocking on doors of farmers. It's keeping a relationship in the off season. That's hunting. And, and, and ducks, yes, yeah, they'll come to a mojo, but you got to figure out what field they're over, what field they're feeding in, and you still have to hit that no, right. That's why I said, I'm not trying to take away that there are elements to it, but once you're there, we were... We were set up for geese. Yep. We had mojos out yeah. there just in case there was ducks. We didn't ha we didn't decoy goose. We decoyed a couple off to our right. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how much you scout. We were where the birds were the day before. We were on what That's you call fact. the yeah. X. So as weary as they are, you think you tricked two of them out of 500. <laughs> right. 
you'd think you'd kill a few of them. I'm just, my mind is boggled on how difficult the goose hunting was, is here right now. I know y'all kill them. This has nothing to do with talent or work ethic or windshield time, as you say. I, when I drove back from that hunt tonight, I was literally in a lull of like, and I told these guys when we got here, in my whole career of waterfowl hunting, I've never got my ass kicked like I just did for these 10 days on geese. I literally would brag to people like, I can kill can of geese with the best of them. And now I feel like I'm starting over. What decoys do I need? Do the new calls I just came out with with jargon <laughs> suck? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe those suck. But uh, it's like, did I flag right? I've blown through those. They're outstanding. Thank you, Case. I love that. I started, card. you know, calling a solid two to three days ago. And trust me, they're good. <laughs> He does sound like a duck now. He's working on his goose call. I got it. But I'm literally asking myself. <laughs> I'm asking myself. You know what the slump breaker is and when it comes to, like, baseball? You get a little Texas leaguer into right field, and you've been 0 for 22. I'm wondering if my slump breaker is going to come. Slump buster, I should call it. A of slump buster. Remember, you're getting a slump in baseball. You're like, 0 for 22. You can't make contact. Then all of a sudden, a Texas leaguer to right field, you go, you go 8 for your next 12. Of course. What's will. my slump buster going to be? I'm so, I'm so down about my goose hunting skills right now that I, I, I question myself if I should hang it up after that hunting. <laughs> I doubt it. I, I don't believe you're actually questioning hanging it up. But look, this part of this is that people, I, I, and it drives me mad when people are like, "Oh, you hunt geese? That's so easy. They're so dumb." And what drives me bad. Is when people say they're dumb. Okay, I don't, I mean, they got a little teeny brain, right? Size of a pea, no joke. That, so they don't have a high level of intellect. But I'm going to tell you one of the most instinctive animals I have ever seen is the Canada goose. They may be dumb, but their instinct is dead on. And I'll go so far as to say they're 10 times more instinctive than a duck because you can be standing in the middle of a farm field in bright orange clothing. And if there's a spinner near you, there is a duck that might come in if he's over that field. Geese are instinctive. They may not be smart, but their instincts are absolutely dead balls. I, I, well, I would never argue that. They have very good instincts, but they don't have depth perception. They can't see color. Why in the hell can't we kill one? I'm being honest. Like, I could easily come onto this podcast and be like, dude, we mopped them up. We killed them good. I'm simply saying that you could struggle so much in this life of waterfowl hunting because that's what this podcast is. I'm not trying to say that we're trying to compare this to life, which you very easily could of trying to keep your chin up and finding out how to get back on top and stay in your lane and working harder to become, you know, perseverance and everything that goes into becoming a man or a woman and what we want to raise our kids to do. But I'm looking at it like I've never seen so many geese that I didn't have a chance at. And yeah. I mean that. Yeah. That's weird to me. That's weird to me. So I don't, I don't want to be a, bring a negative light to goose hunting in Wisconsin because I know for a fact y'all mop them up. Maybe it's me. Maybe <laughs> it's the camera crew. Maybe it's, I don't know what we did wrong. You guys say, well, we usually kill them out of laydown blinds. Okay. Would we have killed them tonight out in the middle of that field with laydown blinds? Because they came over that field. They didn't even get close enough to see that hide. No. It's crazy. They were in that field this morning. Yeah. 1500 why did plus. they not come out of that buck in that wind at 15 yards off the ground if they were in that field this morning when the farmer cut it it's crazy to me we got our ass kicked that bad yeah we had a perfect wind tonight too perfect wind with the sun in their eyes right they never got the sun in their eyes because they never went downwind and turned into us they just said oh shit we're rolling forget it yeah it's crazy i'm not down about it i mean i'm exaggerating a little bit about my mindset but i really do question my talent of like did goose hunting pass me by like baseball did, right? Like I can't, <laughs> like I, I talk shit to Walker. Like I'll go yard off. No, know? yeah, yeah. No, you suck. It's, you're, you're, you're past your prime now. <laughs> That's why we well, have Chase. I mean, <laughs> just imagine this, you know, we've got, we've had a good solid 15 really good, good people on the ground. You know, Cara has been out there scouting and Luke and. And Julian and Jay. And I mean, we have been looking so forward to this and we put boots on the ground and it, it was crazy because the week before you got here, we were just mopping piles, you know, and it was awesome. And we're like, this is going to be the greatest goose hunting we have ever seen. And the trailer pulls up with the, you know, the, the, 
the the duck hand holding the the world you know and we're like it's here it's happening it's finally going to happen we got we're going to have smiles and piles <laughs> chad shows up into the field and all of a sudden it becomes the november lull the toughest goose hunting we've had and in my recent memory and no joke you know the geese are coming over the edge of the field they're like Hey, Steve, that's building down there. Take a left. <laughs> ask, ask, that that like building, ask that building about turkey hunting in Kentucky. Or no, sorry, that was Lynchburg, Tennessee. It's Tennessee. Yeah, no, Chad and I are really good at hunting together. It's <laughs> sick. Is that what happened? Wow. Chad, why don't you talk about that? We just, just turkeys flew out of the roost and ran the other direction. Yeah, like you, we literally had this local say we got this farms loaded with them. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Are you the greatest scheme in all of it's gotta be, dude. the world? Fake it till you make it. Have you ever killed an animal? Oh, yeah. I swear on my life. I swear on my life. I don't know anymore. I think that I mean, the editors have made me look like I've killed some shit. <laughs> I don't know if I ever have. I don't either. I'm serious. I swear. I'm like, God, did I do that? I, I did almost get killed by a freaking Asian buffalo in Nashville this year, though, on a turkey hunt. An Asian buffalo? Asian buffalo. There's a herd of them on the farm that I was at by, Yeesh. not by you, but it's out by Opryland. <laughs> they- it's all on video. He tried to, she, it was a she. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Wow. What are they, uh, do they look like bison? Or like they, American they're way, buffalo They're bison? way smaller, but they look like the, the bull that had the ring in her nose. And they're athletic as shit. So you take like a bucking bull that's a little bit smaller and the, and, and the same style of horns. So they don't have the, the buffalo horns that come out and then go up. These kind of curve down a little bit. And they, she stomped her feet and like, I said, I'm about to die. Look them up. Look up Asian buffalo. There's a herd of them. I'll show, I'll, I'll introduce you. Do you know Bobby Johnson that? Asian buffet is all I got so far. <laughs> Well, you know, Cape Buffalo kill 300 people a year. They're aggressive, too. A lot of hunters. Yeah, they're, they're anyway, nasty. Anyway, I, I think that I don't know if I'm a good hunter anymore. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm not, but I will not leave this podcast saying that I am. I think it's passed me by. Maybe I'm not un, up to date on how to kill them anymore. Well, maybe being a good hunter is not about killing. But then what would it be about? I you know, I'm a, you got to kill it, some shit. You do. Ultimately, that is the goal of hunting. Yes. But I, I hunted with a 13 year old girl on Saturday. I and took, she killed the deer. I took one. I took, <laughs> listen, listen to this though. I, I took one break, you know, from, since you guys have been here to take a 13 year old mentored hunter out on opening day of gun deer season in Wisconsin, that girl put in, I've been logging hours. She put in more than 76 hours in the cold, in stands, in blinds with me last year. You got to be within arm's reach of a mentored hunter. This girl hunted her heart out and never killed a deer last year. And and I promised her I'd take her out opening day and we'd sit in the blind. And she killed a deer the first day, 10 minutes after opening. She put a perfect shot on a big old doe. She's got meat in the freezer. And you know what? She was a hunter the whole time, man. She was one of the best hunters I ever hunted with. And she hadn't killed something until this Saturday. But what did she do this Saturday? She killed something. Bingo. I don't know if I ever will again. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a point, though. Like, memories, or like ha- who you hunt with and the memories you make doing it matter to me more than hunting. killing something. Like, we uh, you remember killing something earlier today? That was sick, wasn't it, Chad? Yeah. No, we didn't kill anything. I know. We didn't. Ki- we, we watched a bunch of duck and geese fly around because you're Shitty calling calls. just sucks. <laughs> but... <laughs> Joking. You're the best caller. No, I'm time. terrible caller. But we had we had three top quality callers. And you know what today. those two said to me after the hunt? We expected more. That hurt. <laughs> Out of your calling? Yeah, that hurt. Who said that? Those two guys we hunted with, they walked up to me and go, you're not a good caller at all. They didn't say that. <laughs> you should have told them we expected more out of the field. <laughs> what you're talking about with, with the girl you're talking about, though, that, that, is, that is very true. It's like who you hunt with, and but like Chad said, it also ended up with the kill. But yeah. you also want to perform. You don't go into a concert. And go. I'm on. I'm on the road with Luke Bryan and go in there and accept a shitty performance by you. you right. That's why I said it ended with the kill. I mean, that that means a lot too. It does. That I means, I, I, I want to kill some shit. More than kill him, I want to trick him. 
Yeah. And I don't trick geese. That's the anymore. best part I about don't hunting waterfowl, fooling Mother Nature. I don't trick geese anymore. <laughs> I want to get a shirt on there that says that. I, I don't trick geese anymore. I think, you're, That's true. I, I think you're putting a little more weight on this than you should. Oh, really? Yeah. 10 days, 10,000 geese, <laughs> yes. not one decoy. There's another t shirt for you. That is 10 not days, true. 10,000 geese, not one decoy. Welcome to You Should Have Been Here last killed one week outfitters. Outfitters. This whole trip. Huh? You yes, one we goose. Have. One goose. What is yes, it? we did. I killed last week outfitters? Yeah, I should, I should have been, been here last you week. You haven't killed a goose. Personally, no. This whole week? I don't know. Maybe it's COVID. <laughs> It's it's definitely good. I want to make sure the audience understands this has nothing to do with who we're with. This has to do with my psyche telling me something is up with my goose hunting skills because I should be able to kill geese. I've proven to myself for the last 20 years of my Gooses. life, I can kill geese from September until March. Like it's going out of style. So you, there's got to be part of the human psyche that goes, what do I do to change my luck? My good run of bad luck. What do you do on that? Well, and in Wisconsin, where it is, we're hunting pressured geese and we're hunting stale geese a lot of times. It's constantly about the change up. We're constantly changing it up, changing up the hide, changing up the direction, stop, you know, not hunting a fence line, hunting the middle of the field, hunting, finding a, a brush, moving, driving 40 miles in a different direction, uh, a push of cold air, a different wind direction. I mean, that, that is one of the challenges, and that, that is one of, of what gives us such pride in what we do here is because to be a good goose hunter in the state of Wisconsin, you've got to change, up, change it up. And we're constantly back and forth with each other to the point of, of, of you know, circular firing squad of how the decoy should be set up, where we should set up on the field. Is this a good wind direction to hunt this field? Should we hunt a field that was less of an X, but it's got better conditions and a better hide? And I think that's one of the challenges of hunting in the state of Wisconsin is that you've got all these factors that actually matter as to whether the geese are going to finish boots down in the decoys. So where, where do you think that if you had to guess in this part of the country what and i talk about a slump buster because i i need a slump buster it, you know bad obviously if we had two more weeks here would it change yes so 100 percent. 23rd two more weeks you're looking at december 10th it changes 100 percent. you're guaranteed spend two more weeks here and you'll start decoying geese we're going to start getting our second push our second canada push the second migratory push push we're going to have substantially colder weather this is based on years past on the farmer's almanac we're going to get the colder weather that's going to settle in it's going to bring a push of new birds tonight if we'd hunt honest if we'd have put two people at a time in the middle under blinds that are very low profile that looked like the scrapple that was in the field those birds never looked at the other side of the field you know chase said oh if we were on the wrong side of the barn i guarantee you if we were on the other side of the barn those birds would have landed where we were yeah. if you'd have put you know two people at a time traded them out let them shoot their birds uh, under a very low profile lay down blinds uh, they wouldn't have not have had uh, such leery nature when they came over uh, came because you saw it they they came over the power lines they were about 500 yards away and they said uh uh no thanks we were too obvious we'll see you next yeah. year tryouts see I disagree yeah I would disagree 100% those geese did not come off of that roost and notice that blind before they decided they weren't coming into that field now I'm not saying that you wouldn't have got a couple to decoy into the middle of the field in a lay down blind situation but those geese tonight did not have a chance to change their mind based on the vision, the visual concept of that hunt. Well, that sure, would be my argument. They sure changed their mind, though. They didn't, but they didn't ever check up one time. Geese that change their mind come off of the roost, bucking a wind that keeps them lower profile than they were tonight. And then when they see the field that they were feeding in that morning, they will check up. They will get active. They will get vocal. They will. They will maple leaf. They will get. Not one goose did that except that one pair tonight. Most of those geese that came to that field had their mind made up. Like it ain't right. It's not right. And I don't. It was not about the vision that they saw that blind. There's no way. There's that blind was had a backdrop up against it. We were on the X to where the people that scouted it this morning said this is where the geese were this morning right here, along that road. 
So you can't tell me that you, if you would have been out in the middle more, that those because they didn't really even care where we were in that field. They didn't give a shit. Is what I'm, I'm trying to tell you. They came over there going, "It's not it." And that. So what do you think was it? I I already said it twenty minutes ago. Decoys. I want to know what we're supposed to be hunting over now. <laughs> I truly want to know what we are supposed to be hunting. Over how are you going to have out. more? How how could you even possibly have a more realistic decoy setup than what we were stuffers, running? Stuffers, stuffers that are moving, stuffers with feathers that tingle in the wind. I think sometimes. I honestly so think that's this, a real thing. I've hunted over yeah, three hundred bird stuffer kits. Yeah, I've seen them. They're I, deadly. But is that what we're going to? That we have to be all freaking taxidermists to be a goose hunter now? I don't think so. You really don't. I really don't. So you have all the faith in the world in decoys today. Would you hunt over twenty dozen silhouettes just by themselves? I wouldn't have today. No. Why? We we're back. I mean, we're using almost all full bodies all the time now because the geese in this area. So we're dealing with a lot of local geese, a lot of geese that have seen a lot of games out there, and the the silhouettes were were running. Everybody was running silhouettes for the last three years. And so we started running full bodies again, having a lot more success over the full body uh, than the silhouettes. They'll catch the sun the wrong way. They just don't necessarily look natural. They don't move at all. But I think I think sometimes geese will be coming and they see a spread. We had a big spread. We had a big spread of full bodies. I thought it looked good. I thought it looked great. And they'll see that. And I think sometimes they look down and say, why are there so many of us down there and none of them are moving, moving? None of them are walking. None of them are moving. See, then again, I'm going to say that. Did you beat yourself in chess? Queen's Gambit. Really? <laughs> uh, just, you guys keep going. I'm good. Well, that's kind of like goose hunting. What did you do to win? Uh, I'm more successful at this than I am at goose hunting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when you play yourself, Chase, in chess, exactly. you're going to win. I win and I lose, but at least I have a win. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> See, hunting hunting I, with Chad today, I had no wins. Wow. <laughs> See, this is the shit that I'm going to say. But here's the deal. I would argue this again. Let's say I'm an attorney in a court of law. I would say, no, Mr. Joel Clayfish, 59-year-old male from Wisconsin. Oh, my gosh. That's better than 65. They did not get close enough to see that them decoys aren't moving. Now, they could have UV rays because there's a tiny bit of cloud cover. The lighting, the shadowing, maybe. But there's no way that those geese, in their natural instincts, and in their vision, and their sight, and their depth perception, can come over that power line and literally just jar to the right 30 degrees because they didn't think the decoys were moving. I would argue that. I would truly argue that. That's possible. I think that it's one of two things. They will not light in a field until they see a vortex going in with activity and constant, consistent activity to follow the leader. Or they understand that as soon as they see the way that decoys look at a field, which we should seriously be questioning, are they looking real? Did we breed? Me and Fred Zink have had this talk for 10 years. Have we finally bred the smartest goose to where we can't kill them anymore? <laughs> Think about it. Have we bred a smarter goose because we used to hunt them over freaking tires? Right. And now we hunt them over something that looks more like a goose than a goose looks. So have we bred a smarter animal? Well, if you think about it, if you think about it, which ones are you killing? The dumb ones. You're killing the dumb ones. Well, there ain't a dumb goose in the state of Wisconsin. (laughs) I want to ask one thing. Where was the water in the waterfowl hunting the last two days? (laughs) Yes. <laughs> there, I'm just simply saying that water, he's got a point. He's got a point, but up here in the Midwest, it's a lot of dry, like I said, Rice, there's a lot of dry field hunting here. There's a lot of feed hunting here. You go down, you go, you go down to Arkansas, I'm hunting water every day. Where I'm going tomorrow, it's almost 90% water hunting until it's snow goose season. Sometimes they'll get on some mallards in the in the dry corn. But a lot of the hunting up here. Western Minnesota, there's a lot of dry land corn hunting, which again is fun as shit. But I would say that, I don't know, I think 90% chase, I would say 90% of the Canada goose hunting in America is done over dry land of hunting them in the, in the, the feed. Really? Yep. It is for sure in Wisconsin. Everywhere you go. But I'm talking like 
you should at least be like hunting ducks over water, people would think. But up here, there's a ton of prevalent dry field hunting. Yeah. It's not like that all over. When you go to Cal- when you go to like, let's say, Louisiana, you're not going to kill a duck in a dry field. You'll kill him in a flooded rice check, but you're not going to kill him in a dry field. You'll kill specks in a dry rice field, but not ducks. They're not going to dry feed maybe once in yeah. a blue moon. I, I think the reason they do here in Wisconsin, Wisconsin's got more bodies of water, you know, Minnesota's license plate says the land of 10,000 lakes. We have more than that in Wisconsin. And I think when they get to Wisconsin, it's kind of becomes a, a routine or a pattern with waterfowl that they go feed, they go sit on water, they roost on water, then they go to feed in the dry field, then they go sit back on the loaf. Because a lot of these loafs are smaller ponds, smaller areas, medium sized lakes. So they get into a routine and that's your best chance to kill them is when you interrupt that routine and fool them into coming into the dry field where they're going to feed where you know they're going to feed and of course i mean look it's no secret it's a lot easier to scout a dry field in your car than it is to scout water that you can't get to that's you know behind trees or or whatever good point i've heard a lot of people say i don't want to put on waders I want the easiest hunt possible. I want to drive my truck out in the field, set up, drive my truck back out there and pick up. If you wear banded waders, you still stay as dry as you can possibly get. I love that color commentary. <laughs> See that? That is perfect that was, color uh, commentary. That is an unpaid advertisement. <laughs> that was a great marketing presentation. I'm not paid by banded, by the way. I just You will be as you become a better water. I had color. to give Chad one. You keep compliment. doing that, you will be. I, I had a blast. The the camaraderie is unreal. I'm just simply saying to the the what you called what was it called the mid season lull. Yeah. How do you spell lull? L U L L. I think. Is it L U L L? I think so. Would you consider yourself a master speller? <laughs> I would not consider myself a master speller. Were you good at debate, like a master class debater? <laughs> I knew, that, I knew where that was going. What? He's in politics. I was great at forensics. Were you really? Did you like CSI Miami? <laughs> huh? I didn't mean forensic investigation. Horatio Kane when he would I put the sunglasses on? Debate and linguistics. <laughs> the study of linguistics, the use of linguistics. The jargon, if you will. The jargon. Uh, the jargon. Uh, so I've come out with this analogy myself after today. Those guys told me that we hunted with, what were their names? Today, Nick and Dave. Okay, they both told me that you suck as a goose caller, Chad, which is kind of weird for them to tell me. Um, <laughs> didn't I didn't hear that. him say they that. Did say you, that. Chase? I don't Chase know. heard him say that. Are you sure? I swear I heard that. They were talking about this one call that had a weird-looking J on it. That They said, this call sucks for geese. <laughs> oh, the... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Mike. <laughs> that was, that's what they said. For the record, they, Chase, they you can get away that, with saying a lot more than I can. They man. said the wrecking ball rocked. They did. Yeah, no, it killed. It, it brought all of them in today. It was awesome. <laughs> it, it brought he, all the geese to the yard. So he just built up Bandit and then just tore down my goose call company. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much we're breaking even tonight. Uh, I love you, dude. I love you, too. So the... Uh, the moral of the story is that this is not easy. Waterfowl hunting to be consistently successful is not easy. No. I worked with Luke, timing, this should be a good week. Even when we got here, they're like, oh, people think it's going to be the best week. New birds, winds, north winds, cold temps. It just shows you. Everything can look right. And they can still be like, are you, you're not, you're not even going to be close. And that's the thing is that you can get right back on them and something could change overnight that just goes, bam, we're back on our A game. But as a waterfowl hunter, you start to think, when is that going to happen? How is that going to happen? What moves do I need to make? What changes do I need to make? So the moral of the story for the listening audience, Joel, Clayfish and Chase, White Rice, is that you can't base your success on one hunt but can you base your success, your success on 10 hunts? I don't think that you can because you feel success on 10 hunts where you don't hammer them. You still come out of there learning something. You can't give up. This is a hard enough lifestyle. This is a hard enough platform of hunting. 
There's so many pieces of the puzzle that go into it that make it tough. Now, all of a sudden, this week we talked in podcasts of why waterfowl hunting is so intimidating. The costs, the investment, the, the, the laws, the regulations, the identification. There's so much that goes into it. The weather, the climate, the elements, the cold, the wet. Now, all of a sudden, we add another one, which is, you know where I'm going? The law. The law and, and getting your ass kicked. So we did not know this was going to happen. How do you regroup and come back and become a good goose hunter again? Well, look, all those things you said, all the stack of negative potentiality that you just added together, there's one thing that supersedes all of that. And that's the reward when you do have those successful hunts. Because you know, you know, in the vast overanalyzation that happens in this business, in this game, you know you're going to have those winning hunts. If you talk to Mark from Vortex and you asked him, hey, those guys decent bird hunters? What do you think he's going to say? All of them at Chad. <laughs> well. He, t- he texts me. He texted me today and said it was one of the greatest hunts he's ever been on. Yeah. He te- and he texted me saying that was he's had such an amazing week and that hunt was unbelievable. But, Chad, I mean, that's, that's why waterfowl hunting is so analogous to life. Because you get those moments of high and you get the really the doldrums and the speed bumps. And, man, it seems like sometimes you hit a speed bump and a speed bump and a speed bump and a speed bump. You can't even see the entrance ramp. But, you know, at some point in the future, you're going to be back on the freeway. Wow. You're just smart. <laughs> I, at one time, I thought you were out kicking your punt coverage with Rebecca. But now I know what she sees in you. <laughs> Wow. I'm being for real. You just are so well read and so well. I was bragging about how good you are on camera, how energetic you are, how passionate you are. I really do want to shoot that news clip of you talking about my, the, what was it? Say it real quick. <laughs> Sit up at your the news desk. Listen to this, Chase. The verdict is back in the Chad Belding trial. They found him guilty of first-degree intentional homicide in the slaying of ducks and geese throughout Wisconsin. More news in an hour on The Foul Life, your 24-hour news service. (laughs) I'd like like to add an update to that. He's found innocent because he killed no birds. Oh, wow, Chase man. Rice. Oh, wow. Man. That was amazing. That was unreal. <laughs> that is so Ron Burgundy. Yeah, I like when you look to your left and go, back to you. Yes. <laughs> Sylvia? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had a blast, man. This has been really, like, this has been one of those trips to where you, you could look at it like I looked at it from the back seat of my truck because somebody wouldn't let me sit in the front seat. <laughs> big tall lengthy dude over there and you could you could be negative i don't get negative for very long in in life i've learned to pick you pick yourself up you fall down but you learn something you take something out of every hunt i struggle to take things to take a positive out of a hunt like that sometimes what did i learn today what did i really grasp onto today as a waterfowl hunter because as a waterfowl hunter i want to be the best i can be i want to be a perfectionist I don't want to just shoot them at 30 yards because they're passing over my blind. Some people are good with that. It doesn't mean that you're that you're worse than I am or I'm better than you are. It's all choice. As long as it's legal and ethical, do you. Me, I want to trick them every time. Some people are happy with a pile. You eat them every day, that's fine. But I want to figure out what to take out of something every single day. If you're not learning, you're really not doing yourself any justice. But sometimes I struggle of figuring out what do I take out of today's hunt? And you start to look at the negatives, the investment, the time. You should be here. You'd be better well, you'd be better spent, you know, doing this and putting your energy into this. As a waterfowl hunter, it's very easy to get your ass kicked. I really mean that. I've had a lot of ass weapons. But when you get in a lull, like this you have to figure out the good things that come with it and that's the camaraderie that's the memories that's the friends the new family everything that goes into it because you know damn well that the switch can go the other way in a heartbeat 
I always play the devil's advocate in a podcast or a TV situation because you've got to have a thinking man's game going on of like, well, what if? Well, what about this? Well, what about the decoys? Well, what about the sunrise? Well, what about the clouds? What about the UV? What about the wind? What about the chill? Why are they only coming out? That's another part that we didn't even touch on. If you afternoon hunt in Wisconsin, you're done at 4 freaking 30. Yep. 4 30. Like that's early and it's dark as shit. <laughs> so if you're afternoon hunting and they're not coming off the roost until four, you don't have a whole lot of time before your legal shooting hours are up. No. You got to think about so much. You got to think about what can I take out of this to improve? Because it's a never ending game of freaking battle of wits with geese and ducks and their brains are that big and they kick the living piss out of us <laughs> on a daily basis. And I mean this, they control our world. And when people say, well, that's a little bit dramatic. Okay, get into it and see if they don't. Chase has got a successful music career. The only thing he freaking talks about is his new dog, Jack, a duck dog. Well, what do I do this? How do I get to handle this? Do I get a whistle like that? Well, what's this dog truck? What's this? He's eating up. He's, he's like freaking fired up. Wait until he gets on some unbelievable hunts where he's like, holy shit. Now he's going to be like, okay, I need a trailer, I need a boat, I need a UTV, I need this, I need that, I need that, I need this. And then it's crazy. I also don't talk like that, but yes, I do love my dog, Jack. <laughs> don't talk like what? Like you just talked. Like fa- <laughs> like, like smart? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm wondering what you're, you mean. You're not wrong. Though. Uh, the, the enthusiasm. You asked me about a doctor caller. I didn't ask you in that tone. Oh, well, you know what I mean. This is, see, here he goes. He's picking me apart. (laughs) He does it all the time. (laughs) He does it all the time. Anyway, are you not eating up with your dog? I am. I'm literally diving full into what you guys have been talking about because of my dog. And that's what I'm saying. If you're going to get into this game, it is going to consume you. Does it not consume you, Luke? Oh, absolutely. It consumes the living piss out of you. It's consuming. It will ruin your life. No. And I mean that with every inch of the fabric in my body. It won't. There's nothing that has happened better in my life than waterfall hunting. Nothing. I, it, not even a, the birth of your two daughters? I'm saying there's nothing that's happened recent in my recent life that gives me the peace in my life, the enjoyment in my life, the testament to my uh, intellectual challenge of trying to figure out the game on a daily basis, getting up at three o'clock. In the, I, mean, I mean, when that alarm goes off at three o'clock in the morning and you got to go to work, you know, or school, you have a certain, man, is it hard to get out of bed? But when that alarm goes off at three o'clock in the morning and I'm going to go to a 20 degree Fahrenheit field and set up decoys, the possibility, the hope that it could happen right that way and we could get the formula right. I mean, it's like mad scientists. Stuff. That's a good point right there, the formula. That's something that we should take out of this to end this conversation is what is it? How much does it change? How much chemistry do you need to know to figure out what the daily formula is? And when it does go wrong so many times in a row, what are the steps that you take to change up your formula? It's a lot of things in there. Waterfowl hunting, again, I'm going to say it like this, is very difficult in my opinion. If it was easy, I don't think we would do it as much, right? I don't think we would. Easy is going to the grocery store and buying your meat. It's very difficult. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of investment like we talked about before. I just want to figure out, like, what do you find to take out of a hunt during the lull when, you've tr- when you try every day to learn and take something out of it? I think that that is a lesson that you got to ask yourself of what did we learn today? What did we do today to become better for tomorrow? And I think we do. But how many times do you keep going to that well until it switches? You said in the next two weeks it's going to switch. I'll be very curious to see your pictures and and Luke's pictures over the next two weeks of what of what changes occur during the next, you know, the going into the late season, the December part of the Canada Goose season. Yeah. Well, and in Wisconsin, now's the time we get snow, and that's a game changer. I mean, you know, you were talking about the, the goose ability to see, they see in two dimensions. And when you have snow and you got snow covers out, they do not see the hide. 
And that's, I mean, boot bag stuff there. And that's a fascinating, we all love the snow. We all got our white sheets. My wife was yelling at me the other day, where did the white sheets go? Well, she doesn't know they're folded up in the corner of the garage because I was using them to cover blinds last year. <laughs> you use just regular white sheets? White sheets over the top they of us. They don't turn blue with the... You got to make sure they don't have a bluish hue to them. You got to get the warmer white sheets. I think it's eggshell, technically. So you go to the <laughs> store to buy sheets for goose hunting? We do. You're crazy. You're in the back. You're sh- you're yeah, crazy. we cover the blinds with them. He and cares. He cares. They cannot, man, I, I'm talking about you got a white hat on your head. You're tucked under that sheet, and those geese are coming, and they are at your boot bags, no questions Dying. asked. Dying. When it's snowing. I love hunting oh, in the oh, snow. Oh. And that's something that's going to happen in the next two weeks. We'll probably get our first snowfall or we'll get some accumulation. Uh, that's a big game changer. The colder weather is going to push some more Canada uh, geese down from Canada into Wisconsin. The Mississippi Flyway bordered you know, uh, Mississippi River and the Great Lakes. And this is just such a fantastic place to hunt because you constantly have those changes and what's going to drive me nuts is that in the next two weeks we're going to be sending chad and chase and walker and mark we're going to be sending them pile picks oh yeah and then it's going to be that. you should have been here next week <laughs> outfitters you should have been here and you should have been here last week yeah. <laughs> we will end it like that with the great the powerful Joel Clayfish. Clayfish. Cleefish. It's pronounced Klee. Or I mean, it looks spelled Klee. It's German. Klee is clover. Clay. Clay. Vote for Rebecca Clayfish, your next Wisconsin State governor. She stands for the right things with a huge endorsement from Mr. Uncle Ted Nugent this past seven days. Thank you, Ted. You are a true and a fine gentleman. The Motor City Madman. He wrote one of the sexiest riffs of all time in rock and roll history, Cat Scratch Fever, and he endorses Rebecca Clayfish. Vote for Rebecca and go out and get Chase's new song. I love the new song. It's on iTunes. He wrote it by himself. The story behind it's pretty badass. Do you want to say the name of it? It's called Vote for Rebecca. You wrote a new song? Sing it real quick. <laughs> Vote for Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> that almost yeah. sounded. That sounded yeah. like the Nuge. That, that sounded sound, like the Nuge. That a sounded bit. for Rebecca. That sounds like Jack Black in School yeah. of Rock. <laughs> There's my endorsement. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my endorsement. Right. Chase Rice, thank you. Luke Steed, Steeds, Steedel, or Steidel. I've heard it pronounced every way. Cat, you're a true badass woman. Thank you for all your help this week. Joel. What do you think of Bubba? He's awesome. He's awesome. It has been my honor to host you guys here. It's been an absolute uh, uh, dream come true. It's been fantastic. Dream come true. For real. That's going a little far. Doing nightmare. Cooking. <laughs> nightmare. We did throw mind. down on some meals. This has been freaking fantastic. It's been fantastic. And Chase Rice said those tacos were the best taco he's ever had. And that's saying a lot coming from Chase Rice. I've had a lot of tacos. <laughs> I did. I have too. Lots. Wow.